Uh, and so tonight I'd like to tell you a little story, uh, uh, really a primer, because there's just not enough time to go through all of the U.S. revenue private die proprietary stamps that exist and that are out there. Uh, but I'd love to tell you a bit of a story here on at least an area that's near and dear to me. And while I collect pretty much all of the private die revenues and all the general revenues for that matter, I really have the past 25, 30 years focused on the, the match of medicine, as they're affectionately called, as well as playing cards and, uh, uh, and uh, but mostly the medicines. That's really uh, where I focus on. Uh, and you'll see the title here is the, the private the private diet proprietary medicine stamps and their nostrils. And we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through this. And I'll give you a little bit more of a, a backstory and a history as well, um, just to expand upon the introduction of proprietary tax stamps. And so as you heard earlier too, and I'll, I'll go specifically into these, by the 1850s, many US drug catalogs listed over 400 different proprietary medicines. So that by the 1860s, the US government looked to numerous industries to collect revenue to meet the ever-growing expenses from the Civil War. And so these really were an outgrowth direct from the Civil War and the government needing to generate some revenue. So that by August of 1862, the printing of tax stamps began for such commodities as playing cards, matches, perfumes, cosmetics, canned fruit, and there is only one stamp for the canned fruit, uh, and then the lucrative business, the very lucrative business of packaged remedies, uh, also known as proprietary medicines. And that's kind of where we'll focus tonight. Uh, these engraved stamps were produced from modest to eye-catching, and I will try to share some of those with you tonight. Uh, and while more than 2 billion were produced, many are unobtainable. They were invariably torn off the bottle or the package or the box when it was opened, uh, they served multiple purposes. They were advertising, they paid the tax, they sealed the container in some cases, and they were not meant to be saved. Uh, they were meant to be ripped open. They, they secured in many cases and confirmed that it was a legitimate product by that vendor. Uh, and only when the seal was broken did you know that you, you, know, you had the true, the true product and the tax was paid uh, uh, by, those, uh, by those taxes. So, so what is in that nostrum? Uh, you know, nostrum is one of those, I guess, what, quack, quack medicines, depending on how you want to term it. Many of the proprietors claimed they had magic cures. Uh, and out of all of these that have been studied and as many books written, and I have references at the end that I'll share with you for those that are interested, there were at least 35 or so physicians within this diet, you know, medicine proprietary space or persons claiming to be physicians. They would use the word doctor in front of their name names many instances, and in some cases, there is no record of them being, quote unquote, a, a physician. Um, they were retailers and wholesale druggists. They were apothecaries. They were ministers. Some were liquor merchants. You might imagine many of these elixirs had a very high percentage of alcohol. There were clerks and showmen and bookbinders. So the list is long of the folks that engaged in private uh, dye proprietaries in the medicines. Uh, a few gained some fame, and some were elected congressmen, such as Demas S. Barnes and Ray Vaughn Pierce, and I'll talk about Barnes later on. Um, by the end of the 19th century, uh, as you heard earlier by Paul, there was an outcry by many folks, so journalists, physicians, and pharmacists, over the secrecy of these nostrums. What was in that elixir that we were taking and ingesting, or the pills that we were chewing on and or eating, uh, and, and a myriad of other things that were being put at there, bombs and salves. And so uh, they were concerned about exposing possible dangers in some of these patent medicines. And as you heard earlier, this led to the enactment of the 1906 Food and Drug Act. Uh, and a number of things followed even shortly thereafter, but this really led up to that. So what I'm gonna try to do tonight here is uh, follow with a brief overview of some of the firms, some select firms, some of their products that they manufactured. And really what I believe are just amazingly beautiful stamps engravings, designs, printings, papers, subject matter topics of these private die proprietary stamps. I could spend a whole nother uh, presentation, which I will do probably late this year, early next year. And I will expand to the matches. I will expand to the playing cards. I'll expand to the perfumes. And what I'm also gonna show you tonight are actual products that I have in my collection, as well as the stamps that actually have the stamps on them that they were used for or facsimiles thereof from this era, 
So hopefully you'll enjoy this little trip that I'll take you on uh, to show you a number of different vendors and, uh, and proprietors. Uh, and so here is the first, Dr. Herrick, sugar-coated pills and plasters. In late 62, right when this was happening during the war and the taxes were coming out, certain manufacturers questioned the government if they could obtain distinctive stamps with their own design and or trademark. They saw this as a great opportunity for advertising uh, and for marketing their wares. Uh, and so Dr. Herrick was the first. Uh, who had his request approved on October 25th, 1862. That's fairly early on, uh, right after uh, the enact came out. And he became the first to take advantage in the trade. And so L.R. Herrick, MD, was an MD. He was a, a medical doctor, originated his sugar-coated vegetable health pills. Uh, and he marketed it as a cure for many ailments. And again, a lot of this has been documented and uh, Holcomb is one of the main references, which I'm going to refer to. Uh, he also sold many different kinds of plasters, um, an adhesive strip of material for covering cuts and wounds. We know it better today, and I'll use the product name Band-Aids. Uh, these are just what they are, and this is what they were called back then, and they still are called today. Here, I'm just showing you two uh, of the different stamps uh, that he produced. The, this is quite a large stamp. Uh, this is not a small stamp, but this is almost a scale. This is a little bit larger here on the right, RS-117, one cent black. Uh, you'll see that a lot of these uh, proprietors put an image of themselves on the stamp. Uh, they have the tax here at the top, or they also even say the dose. Uh, and the price is 25 cents for this stamp that this was on for this box of sugar-coated pills. Uh, and the tax on it was one cent. You can see the large one numeral here as well. And it said sugar-coated pills, U.S. Internal Revenue Service. Many of what I'm, uh, stamps I'm going to show you were printed by the well-known uh, engravers and printers of this era, um, uh, starting with you know Butler and Carpenter uh, and the firms out of Philly. You'll later move on to the National Bank Note Company, et cetera, et cetera, which is what we'll see. These, some of these had a very long lifespan from the early 1860s to the 1870s, 1880s and beyond. Uh, and so uh, the engravings are, in many cases, uh, they're, they're quite exquisite and I'll show you uh, a number of them. Uh, and again, they, they, they served multiple purposes of paying the tax, advertising their wares. They were on the products. You would break them when you open them up. They were printed on a myriad of paper types, old paper, silk paper, watermark paper, pink paper, uh, and in some cases, experimental silk, just like any other stamps that we study and we look at at the time in the revenues or even general issues, you'll find double transfers uh, and you'll find uh, paper folds. So all of these you can find when you're studying this as well, not only the various designs and paper types. Again, a really fascinating area. Here's just one example. And you'll see the stamp here in red, the RS-118. Again, he issued another stamp, uh, which was for Herrick's pills and plasters. Uh, and he also, uh, this was a one set revenue too. Below, I just show a proof. So you can also collect the proofs uh, of these and essays as well for the match of medicines, if you will, private doctor proprietaries. The next slide, I will show you an actual package. So here is Dr. Herrick's sugar-coated pills, plain. Plain is on the side of the box here. You really can't see it in red type. Uh, circa, this is about 1920, so a little bit later. Uh, with the original contents, the dimension of the box is like a little matchbox. It's 50 by 30 by 20 millimeters. Inside of this box, you can see the original Sugar-coated pills, no, I have not tried one, nor will I try one. Um, and inside the box is also this piece of paper discussing the directions for it. Two pills is the dose in ordinary cases. They should be taken at night. Uh, and it goes through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, insist on having them genuine. If your dealer does not keep them, order them from us. We will send them to you by mail. Postage prepaid. So here you go, Dr. Herrick's Family Medicine. This one did not have a stamp on it by this time in 1920. It has some details on the back and it says May 1920. But the earlier boxes would have had, if I go back, this stamp would have been on that box, sealing it. You would have broke it, opened it up and gotten access to your pills. So here is an example of, again, where I study the stamp and the person behind it and the company and also try to marry the product itself that was produced by that proprietor. 
at that period. Again, very fascinating. These are out there. You do not come across them that often. And it's really, I think, the joy of the hunt to find the stamp and the product or the bottle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's one example. Let's try another example. This is really a beautiful stamp as well, and it is not small as well. It's a 41 by 50, give or take, and it is on silk paper. I showed you an example of the back of the stamp and the silk, so you could see the just the silk fibers peppered throughout. It is RS34B if you're looking in your Scott catalog. All of these, by the way, are in your Scott specialized catalog uh, in the revenue sections. They are listed as RO uh, uh, for the matches, RP for the canned fruit, RS is for the medicines, uh, RT for the perfumes, and RU uh, for the matches. Uh, and there's a few other little sections within there as well for some labels. But these are in your Scott Specialized Catalog if you go in that section and look for them. Uh, Brandreth Pills and Alcox Porous Plasters, uh, another company. They were first manufactured in 1835 in New York City, shortly thereafter moved to Ossining. Uh, and soon Alcox Porous Plasters became another product line. But he was also attuned to advertising very early on too, and he commissioned private dye stamps. Here's just an example of one of his uh, pretty stamps that he uh, had issued in July of 63, and they printed them for about two years. Uh, these were issued in the millions on old paper, uh, even more on silk, but a lot less of them on old and silk were perforated. So you'll usually find these uh, imperforates of different styles and types. Here's just the largest example of it that was again used on their products to seal the packaging that would have been ripped and open. Uh, and here is an example of a Brandreth Pills wrapper. The one at the upper left you'll see says chocolate coated on it. So I have this and it's got a facsimile looking stamp. After the stamps went away, these uh, proprietors still wanted to be able to advertise. So they removed, if you look at the stamp here, you will see U.S. internal revenue on the left and proprietary and one cent. But they were able to make facsimiles and they removed the U.S. internal revenue and they got rid of the one cent, but they still were able to advertise on their packaging, uh, you know, what folks had become accustomed to in seeing it, uh, even though there was no more tax at this particular period that they had to pay. This wrapper is about 60 by 45 by 20. You'll see the one below left is for plain, uh, uh, not sugar-coated for these pills. Inside of this wrapper is also this advertising multiple sheets of paper here telling you about their entirely vegetable and innocent pills. And they give you all sorts of details on it and the healing and the tonic and all that good stuff. Um, and I just show at the lower right, many of them also issued uh, Almanacs or calendars, another way of advertising during this period of time from the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, and a lot of these were given away for free or were made available when you purchased their products. And so, you know, they'd have almanacs and calendars and how the weather's doing and the rising of the moon, et cetera, et cetera. And they would then also advertise their wares and others to get as much of this out into the public hands as possible, of course. And so here's the marriage between stamps uh, and these other items that I really think I find fascinating. Here's another group, Fleming Brothers out of Pittsburgh. You again, I hope you're seeing the different sizes and shapes and dimensions of the stamps and the, also the engravings. They are amazingly diverse. Here is one, Dr. C. McLean, who passed in 55, but his proprietary medicines lived on as the products of the Fleming Brothers who put a lot of products out there. They were out of Pittsburgh and you could see the top stamp in the bottom there, RS-88, RS-90. They were issued in 63, all the way up until 1880 on various paper types, either old or silk or watermarked early on by the Carpenter, then later on by the National Banknote, et cetera, et cetera. And they're just beautiful little stamps. Uh, they're strips, they're issued in perforate. You'll see the top one again, a nice portrait of my, one of my favorite uh, images there is, you know, of Washington. Looks like my three cent 1851 that I study. And you'll see the advertising on it, right? Dr. McLean celebrated Vermifuge, Fleming Brothers, Pittsburgh PA proprietors. And so they had a lot of different products. They had their American worm specific Vermifuge and cruciform for rheumatism of man or beast. I mean, they were peddling this as far and wide. Um, they had ivory polish for teeth and Mikado cologne and even a kid's double D cough syrup. 
Uh, and so again, beautiful stamps uh, come in a number of different uh, sizes and shapes. The one below is, is uh, they ended up with a blue stamp. They did first issue it in black uh, originally in 1863 on old paper. Very rare, not common. You don't see them. Again, 193,000, you think they would be out there. Again, most of these were used on packages and boxes and products and were ripped to open the product and or destroyed, and then they were thrown out. But what I'm going to show you on the next slide is a great example of a box that has survived that's in my collection, which I have in front of me, which I'm happy to show during show and tell. Here is an actual box circa 19, 1875 that is unopened and sealed uh, of a Fleming Brothers box, which still has the contents in it. If you shake it, you can hear them. The actual uh, celebrated liver pills are inside. And so I tried to give you every angle. Here's the top with the stamp still on it. At the left, you'll see the stamp is wrapping around this beautiful wrapper. It's sealing the ends of the box. It is unopened. The dimensions of this box are about 60 by 40 by 20 millimeters. So a little bit larger in size than, but about the size again of a traditional box of matches. Um, and you'll see the stamp on top wrapped around. This one's on silk paper. You'll see on the back, the advertising. Uh, in sick, head, ache, and all, bilious complaints surpassed the price by, you know, by none, 25 cents. So here's a beautiful artifact that has survived intact, um, that has not been opened, showing the stamp doing its thing. It's paying uh, the tax, it is advertising the product, and it is sealing the box and the wrapper. The wrapper itself was also printed. It's really a nice box, and I've seen these open. It's a really nice uh, printing as well from the period. I show on the right, as you, as you, you know, I, I like all sorts of advertising as well. Here's a trade card uh, of the many of thousands of thousands of trade cards that exist for all of these proprietors to promote. Um, and they were dispersed at all sorts of druggists and shops across the country that would then sell their products. And this one just happens to be from Burton, a druggist and a dealer in McLean's liver pills down in Baltimore, Maryland. And on the back of that card, it's not plain. It actually talks about the pills and gives some directions and the values of why you should be taking these. So here, here is a, a survivor from that area that was not broken open, that was uh, found in this region, actually found in, in Gettysburg, uh, a couple of towns away from where I am here in Lancaster. That's where this was located. So let's go to another really one of my famous, this is really a beautiful stamp and the Swains and the Swain family MD out of Philadelphia, really put out a panacea and a stomach ache elixir. They established a proprietary medicine business in the 1820s. They had a lot of different elixirs up until about the 1870s. And it's believed William Swain is the son of James Swain, who took over the business. These stamps were printed by a, a group that we know, Putler and Carpenter. They printed uh, our general first, second, third issue revenue stamps. Uh, and Carpenter, we know, is of Topin Carpenter and fame, who printed the who won the contract in, in July of 51 to print uh, the you know, general US stamps, you know, uh, the one cent, the three cent, the 12 cent. They were directed to engrave a private die in a strip form. And I'm gonna show you these strips. They, I believe are beautiful. They're in orange. I show a little bit of a snippet at the lower right with dragon headed snakes on it, very fanciful. And it was used as a cork seal on their bottles. Uh, it measures 160 by 32. It is a quite a large strip. Uh, and they were printed in sheets of 16 and two by eight, imperforate or die cut. And they were printed on various types of paper again. And the one I'm showing you is a printed signature, but very few and very rare are those that have a manuscript signature on there. There's not many out there. The six cent is by far the rarest of these. Only 17,000 were printed on old paper, not many out there. And there is a census of everything I'm showing you for some of these types. And uh, Mike Aldrich, who many of you may know, and a good friend for many years, sort of studied this and put books out on this, as well as a census, and has kind of been keeping that going for decades now since it was published. I give the reference at the end, uh, and others have kept that going, kind of to put in its place where these items lie. And of course, for me, you know, I'm always on the search and hunt, and I think there is still more to be found, not just for this, but some of these other rare varieties. Uh, and a census is only as good as you know when it's published, and new discoveries are still out. So uh, again, it reminds us to continue to be on the search. They also issued an eight cent one, one that was with James Swain on it, the one I'm showing you there and I'll show you next, J-A-S. And then they also issued another one that had William 
on it when his son took over. He then took the same die and they printed William on it. And a few, again, rare have his signature on it. Um, and they were issued on old paper and silk paper and a few even on watermark paper. Not a lot. They're out there and they're pretty. And I'll show you here. It's just two of my examples. I, I think I probably have seven or eight, maybe more. And a few of you probably have some out there. I'm really fond of this. And you know, I also like to restore these. These were on top of a bottle. They were usually ripped in half. I will show you on the next slide an example of, of what I believe these bottles look like because I, I made a creation. I, I have uh, something to show you here. Uh, but the top one is the James Swain. Uh, you'll see this one is die cut as well. It's a large orange. You'll see the snakes, the head, the dragons, call them what you want. Again, it's eight cent. It's really finely engraved. I think the top one is on old paper. The bottom one may be on silk. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but that's the eight cent William Swain. Uh, and again, that one I restored as well. It needed a little bit of work in putting that together. And it took a couple of days, but I think it came out really pretty fine to restore that. Um, I just wanted to share a little picture of Swain, the real Dr. Swain. And, uh, you know, and I even found a headstone for him and we know where he's at. Um, but what I have in front of you in the middle is a bottle. And I also like to pair bottles if I can of the elixir. This is a hand blow in mold, applied lip BMO bottle. It's got an early smooth base. It's aqua in color and it's round with sunken panels. And you can see Swain's there on the front, trademark. On the other side, you'll see Panacea. And again, they also issued really beautiful labels that would go on these bottles. And an example that I'm showing on the right is an example. And this was engraved by Draper and Company in Philadelphia, a very well-known engraver and printer for banknotes. They did essays. I mean, they're, they're very well-known. They also were... Uh, uh, engaged by Swain to print this amazing uh, label that went on the bottle. And so to have that also as well uh, in, in a collection to complement the stamps, I think is really neat to have. And it also served, you know, a little bit of directions there as well, but you can see the delicate rose engine and tessellated work that's on that label. Really pretty fine engraving for the day, of course, with a picture of William in the middle. So what might a bottle in the 1860s or 70s look like with the label and it filled and with the stamp on top. So here is my creation of a facsimile with my bottle and a copy of the label and a copy of the stamp of how it would have looked when you would have bought this off the shelf at any local store. The label, the stamp was on top with glue on it on all sides to be sealed. We've seen those today on bottles with the revenue stamp tax to on the sides, they, they're out there. You've seen them up until about the 60s or so, and then they went away. This is how it looked. Uh, and then the label on the front, and I just happened to put a little water in there with some green food coloring to just make up an elixir. So, and it was cork sealed. Uh, and so this particular bottle is from St. Louis. They continue to expand in Missouri. There are other bottles that have Philadelphia on them, et cetera, et cetera. But here uh, is what it looks like. And I can show it later, but it's in front of me on, on my desk when I, when I stop sharing the talk. So that's how these packages looked uh, for those that issued bottles. And you could imagine why the stamps were damaged. They were cut in half. You would slice it open at the top. So many of the Swain stamps you find have a neat cut at the top and they're in two pieces. So I, I, you know, they serve their function as revenues, as sealing the bottle, as advertising. And when you find one of these and can restore it and put it in your collection, I think it's a great find. So here's another one we alluded to earlier and we saw, and I know David's gonna have one of these later. You know our good friend, David Hunt, but I also, and then one of my favorites is the William E. Clark out of Providence, Rhode Island, Hunt's Remedy, the great kidney medicine. Uh, his remedy dates back to early days in Manhattan. It was manufactured well before Clark took this over in 1872. Uh, he added health pills and a liver cure and his infallible eye wash. So again, they, they tried to market as much as they could during this period as broadly as they could. Uh, he passed away late 1880. The business operated as Hunt's Remedy and no new stamps issued, but these are the ones that I'm going to show you two that were issued. This is probably one of the more unique designs in all of Philatel. Uh, it's a bit macabre, but it really is, I think, one of the best designs that's out there. It shows an image of a man grabbing the neck of death you can see a scythe and an hourglass just below the skeleton to the left in those plants, preparing to strike him with what no doubt is a bottle of Hunt's Remedy. Um, and it was issued in 1880, not many issued. These are not common. 9,000 were printed on watermark papers. And I think the catalog does it somewhat justice at least for it. 
uh, but they're really pretty. And this is a small stamp. That is not the scale. It's definitely the size of a standard definitive United States stamp. And here, I like to show trade cards around the products to show you how they were, again, marketing and promoting. Uh, and, and on the left is, a, is a, an image, a cartoonish sort of image of, of Hunt's Remedy, uh, you know, the great kidney medicine never known to fail. It will help you. What is a cure? Dropsy and all disease of the kidneys. Boy, talk about putting it out there and marketing and advertising. There's a young person sitting on the chair being fanned uh, and the fellow's looking to, uh, to administer that elixir. Uh, and in the middle is Hunt's Remedy other stamp. They issued two. They issued the three cent and they issued the six cent. And that you see is a nice six cent black, again, tiny stamp. Again, about the size of a definitive, a traditional U.S. definitive. It's got a banner in the middle, Hunt's Remedy, the great kidney medicine. That, again, was issued in 1879-80. It's on watermark paper. And again, they did not issue a lot of those either. These are just two very pretty, nice little stamps. And you'll see on the right another trade card. About 1883, totally different image of a young person, sailor, just beautifully printed on a really nice trade card. Uh, and I do like those to complement, again, the collections of stamps covers uh, and the actual packaging. Here's the Benjamin Fostock. Again, a different type of stamp, long and perforate, not perforated out of Pittsburgh. Again, they had vermifuge. It never fails. Everyone was trying to kill intestinal, whatever you might have had. They started marketing 1830. Uh, they required stamps early on as well. And so they also were early to the game in 1863. It is a beautifully engraved stamp. Two really nice ones. I'll show the top and the bottom. One, they're both a lake color, um, an eagle facing left with the branch. It's imperfect. It's on old paper. The one on the bottom is on watermark paper, but two different designs. Because in 68, uh, Fonestock uh, passed and Schwartz and Haslett took it over. And they continued to use his stamps until 75. They then issued some new stamps. And you'll see they changed the design a little bit. They used the base, uh, the base design. But if you look below the one on the left, you'll see Pittsburgh was moved to the right on the lower stamp. Uh, and you'll see that they replaced Pittsburgh here on the left with J.E. Schwartz, which was in the modified design. So again, two beautiful stamps in really nice condition. Uh, again, these again were ripped. You'll find them in a myriad of conditions, uh, uh, bends and folds and tears and missing pieces and all that. Again, they were not meant to be kept and saved for us. These were meant to be used uh, on products and ripped open. And then again, boxes were thrown away. So again, for these to survive, we're fortunate. And they also issued an almanac and they gave them out free and they wrote it on. B.A. Fonestock and Co's number 12, their free almanac. This is from 1859. I have a myriad of these and all sorts of other almanacs. They're really interesting reading of the day to get a peek at what was going on during this period before the Civil War, during the Civil War, after the Civil War, into the Reconstruction period, et cetera. And again, a nice trade card. Again, an interesting advertisement. If you saw that on a shelf coming into any store, you would probably be drawn to that. Uh, and it's those jolly St. Nick. He's dancing, missing a glove. He's holding holly. Three owls. You turn it over and it's an advertisement. Children often look pale and sickly from no other cause than worms and spasms, etc. So what do you give them? You give them the firmifuge. So this is sort of how they, they failed it. And they said it never fails. Physicians do not hesitate to recommend and use it. So, you know, again, falling into this, did it work? Did it not work? Quack medicine, et cetera. This is why, again, pre, pre FDA, if you will, what was in that elixir? The other challenge and the other area that I love, and I think many of us as we're searching for things is, and I won't tell you a lot about the JB Rosen company out of New York, but they had a centaur liniment in Castoria, beautiful little stamp. That's a tiny little stamp, 40 by 12 millimeters a little label, if you will. Um, and it has a centaur in the middle, nice engraving. And this one has a major double transfer in the two cents at the top label and top frame one. And, you know, it takes years to look and find these. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I love the fly specking and I was able to plate it. And I have three copies and you can see them on the right. We've identified multiples. And this is from position one, top row. There's a guide dot in the center, double dots at the upper right, multiple side scratches and a scratch at the top. And you can see the three that I show on the right with the normal copy and then three different copies showing the double transfer. Um, and just again, another little area that we look uh, when we're studying these, this does get called out in the catalog as you might imagine. And so again, other areas that we're used to and say collecting general, general issues 
or any other stamps, you can find those same. They were engraved, dies, transfer old plates, printed paper, et cetera. And so the same production issues that would happen uh, would happen here for these stamps. They are stamps at the end of the day. And this I think was also printed by, I think this was Butler and Carpenter. They come in different scents. They come in different colors. And again, on different paper, I just wanted to share this with you because uh, you just don't see the double transfers that often. Uh, but when you do find them, it's exciting to really see that shift. And I check my glasses also every time I see them to make sure I'm not seeing double. In that case, I was. One of my favorites, and I'm going to show you this one and talk a little bit about it, is Fred, Fred Brown's Essence of Jamaica Ginger. Again, another large stamp, 52 by 103 millimeters. This served multiple purposes. It was not only a stamp and a revenue stamp and paid the fee. It was on the bottle of Jamaica Ginger. And the directions were on it as well at the bottom, which I'll show you. But he manufactured and advertised Brown's Essence of Ginger and a colorable mixture and several other proprietaries early into the 20th century. Uh, he opened an apothecary shop or a lab, as he called it, uh, in Chestnut and Fifth in Philly. It's on the stamp. He advertised where he was, and you could see it at the bottom of his stamp. Here's just one example. He, there were two different varieties I'll show you. But what was in his Jamaica Ginger? Ginger, calamus, snake root, cinnamon, mace, cloves, and of course, 50% alcohol. Boy, I would love to go in and buy one of those bottles and I would definitely feel better, I would think. Interestingly, you'll see it says take with sugar and water. So I find that interesting as well that you want to mix that, uh, especially looking at the contents. His oldest son, Fred Brown Jr., graduated from Philly College of Pharma, 61, joined the firm and took control. Um, and this, again, is our carpenter and company that did this engraving. This is, again, a beautiful engraving. Um, these were issued on old paper, silk paper, pink paper, watermark paper. So... Some people just collect when you're collecting the private dies. One example of a really good example of each issue. Others will collect every type of paper that they are on. And with, there are catalogs uh, you know, that exist for that. Mike Aldrich has put one out. Uh, another fellow, Randall Chet down in, in the Carolinas has put one out as well, Match of Medicine. There's some really nice catalogs, albums out there, if you will, to store these in, depending on the, the angle you want to go. I'm happy to share more about that after. But let's talk about just again, two different uh, dies are issued here, or at least two different dies exist, and they get two different Scott numbers, R37 and 38. And Fred had a facsimile signature on the stamp running up on the left. And the first one that was issued had an incomplete E, so it did not look like Fred. He did not like that. So he went back to uh, Carpenter and said, you really need to make the E look like an E. So they went into the original die, they recut it. Now it looks like an E. So you have two different types, die one, die two again, found on different paper types. And I just wanted to highlight here at the bottom of this stamp slash label, um, the dose here. It said for you know, a grown person, you know, a teaspoonful for a child, 10 to 12, a half a teaspoon for a child, two to five, 10 to 20, 15 to 20 drops, and to be given with sugar and water. And, and again, I think it's just beautiful. If you look at this, again, portrait of uh, Washington looking to the left, well known, you've seen this before, Carpenter reused a lot of their uh, uh, well-known dies uh, for a number of these stamps, as you know. Uh, they also printed, as we know, the revenues too, and the, they were partly involved with at least Carpenter, not just Butler, in, you know, uh, in the 1851s. And you can see the, the, the rosettes and the tessellation here around the central figure. It is, it's, if you look closely at this engraving, it is really probably some of the most intricate and beautiful engravings, and it does rival. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about the Persian rugs and those larger revenues and that large format revenue, those larger dollar revenues with that fine engraving, like uh, RS102, R102, the $200 multicolor uh, revenue. It really rivals that. It may be an all black palette, but it really is beautiful engraving. So we're coming to the end of this first piece, and I'll, I'll end with a couple of other titans, I guess, if you will, in this area of private dyes. One of those I'm showing there at the upper right, that is actually not from an issued stamp, but from an essay. Uh, and this is of Demas S. Barnes, D.S. Barnes or Demas Barnes & Co. Uh, he was a congressman. He was a trustee of the Brooklyn Bridge. He was a director of the Long Island Railroad. He was a well-known owner in proprietary medicines patent. He bought a lot of these up, kept these going for many, many years and marketed many, many products. Uh, he was born in 27 in Canada, uh, in New York upstate. Uh, he opened his firm in New York City in 53, and he had branch offices across the country. 
uh, and he had, he was an agent for many proprietors. And, and I'm not going to show you them all, but they're all well known, and there are stamps issued for them as well. Um, and and his that he issued. Um, and there's a little more bio there at the bottom of what he did. Congress, Brooklyn, wholesale firm he sold to John Henry. Henry then created stamps. They're also well known. He retired in '70. Uh, a lot of other interests. Well off gentleman, uh, uh, and he passed in uh, May of '88. You'll see uh, the Centaur Company as well was one of those. Uh, that he had a lot of different interest in. I showed you that stamp earlier. Same for Lyon and Drake and Scoville. Other well-knowns and they issued stamps. These are again, quite beautiful. Uh, uh, he And I'll talk a little bit about them before then ending with Ayers. Uh, the first stamps that he used were not the ones on the left. The ones that he first issued were the ones on the right in black. Even though Scott catalogs 15, 16, 17, the Vermillions, it really, these on the right were issued first. 63 to 65 on old paper. And there's a one cent and a two cent and a four cent. And these are quite large. These are almost shown to size here. These are not small labels. Um, and he had a facsimile signature at the bottom, DS bonds. What you see is if you look down the stamp, why they're so large in the vertical is he listed everything that he was a proprietor of. Drake's plantation bitters, Lion's magnetic powder, uh, Guy Sutt's yellow dock and sarsaparilla, Mexican Mustang liniment, Helm Street hair coloring, and Drake's Catawba bitters. So there you go, all on one stamp, again, on the packaging, on the end door of the bottle, serve the purpose. And again, to find nice copies of these, you do have to search, but they are out there. He wanted to have his stamps in a Carmen color after issuing them first in black in 63, very quickly. He was told uh, he couldn't do it, because of cost, so let's use Vermilion. Another bad choice, because the, the Vermilion ran. So they did a small initial supply and they used, they went back to black. These are not common. Um, these are uncommon. In the census, at least today, for RS-17, the four cent, this is probably one of 25 that are known. These are usually in very bad shape, ripped, pieces are missing, torn, multiple places. Again, you know, looking long and hard over decades, you, you manage to find uh, really good copies. And I was just fortunate to be able, I repatriated the one cent uh, from the United Kingdom. I repatriated the two cent, if you will, from Canada. And I repatriated the four cent from the United Kingdom as well and brought those back here to the US. And again, did a little restoring of, you know, soaking and cleaning and removing any crud or hinges or any other odd pieces of paper really, you know, took some care and pressed them. Uh, and I think they're in fairly good shape. Same for the others. That goes for most of what I've shown you and trying to restore them and bring them kind of back to the way that they looked. Uh, these these uh, proprietors led a hard life because of what they were used for on their packaging um, uh, and that they were ripped or on their bottles. Here then in 64, he instructed Butler and Carpenter, he didn't like his signature. So he wanted to get rid of the S and go with Demas Barnes pre-printed and so he did that with the printing name. They're on old paper. Again, a one cent, a two cent, a four cent. Uh, and again, it lists all his various products up and down. Uh, these again are all on old paper. Uh, there is one really nice foreign transfer that can be found. Those happened as well on the two cent uh, from another stamp that appeared from the die that wasn't completely erased. You could find it very rare. They're out there. So same sort of things we look for when collecting classic US you could find here at this time, because they were being printed in those early days. And then very quickly in 66, he chose to go with these sorts of stamps and he wanted to highlight his medicine warehouse at 21 Park Road down in New York City. And so he went from those long tolls to then Demas Barnes & Co in New York private die. And he issued a one cent, a two and a four. And these are just a couple of examples that I'm showing here. I'm gonna end with another one of my favorite companies here and some products. And one that everybody I'm sure has seen, they were they really uh, advertised broadly across the country, and that's J.C. James Cook Ayer. Uh, in the railroad build, building and, and business, in, inventor, patent medicine, manufacturer, ran their own apothecary in the 1840s, broad and wide, out of Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, and there I'm showing you a beautiful one of their stamps, the one cent stamp, a very long, thin uh, 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 label. Um, and so the act was passed. They very quickly realized they could advertise and differentiate their products. They trialed various colors 
before landing on the one cent black stamp that I'm showing you. Only a few thousand of each of red, carmine, purple, orange, green, and blue were delivered. Very quickly, they landed on red. In most of those other color cases, one or two or three are known, uh, and they're just nearly unobtainable by almost all of us. And you, you rarely ever see them come up. Um, they're just very rare. They landed on black. And that's RS4 right there that I show you. Again, issued on different types of paper, silk, watermark, old, um, but black was chosen. Um, and they were issued up until 1883, even on pink. They issued on pink paper. Really, when you see the pink paper, it's really, it pops at you. It's hard to miss pink paper. Not very common. You don't often see it, but they're out there. And I show you an example of how this particular stamp was used to seal the wooden box that contained uh, uh, the contents. Uh, and so you saw it was used as a wrapper around the lower piece, the wooden base and the top wooden base. And it was wrapped around and sealed glue on the back. And to open that, you would slice it all the way around, separating the top from the bottom. And you were then able to open it and get in and get those pills. So again, this is, they, they, they manufactured or designed these stamps to be functional, to seal in many cases, their product, their box, their bottle, their wrapper, whatever it was. So you see the functionality of the stamp. And of course, Sometimes you find the box and other times you could find the stamp that was not used, uh, uh, even though these were absolutely issued. The next I'm gonna end with some of my favorite. Again, the, the, the dynamicism within how you can find these stamps is, is really never ending. Not just your traditional perforates or imperfs, but how about some really cool die cuts that were cut like this? And so they also issued four cent stamps, beautiful engraving in a blue color, a light blue, a dark blue. You can find them in ultramarine. They were issued in perforate, but they were also cut to star shape. So I'm showing you two here on the left, RS9B on silk, and I think the Ds on watermark. These were used to seal the top of bottles. And so there'd be glue on the back. You put this on the top of the bottle and the fringes or the stars would then fold down and seal it. And that's how you would buy their elixir. They were also originally issued in small quantities in red, vermilion, green, and purple. I think there's only two known in purple and one known in red, maybe that survived and two in green. Very rare, very small, but then they landed on blue. And then that's what they issued. And these are very common, they're affordable. They're a couple of bucks a piece, five, ten dollars. You could find them out there. It's not in, in an astronomical range and they're really very cool stamps. I show you one of my other examples of an RS-10. It's watermarked, USIR. This is X-Joyce, the, 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 the sort of Titan way back one of who really pioneered this as well. This collection, I think, came up in 91. And then having that, I give you the reference, having that book is really a phenomenal reference for matching medicines and perfumes and, 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 and playing cards. And I also backlit that copy above, um, which is, again, a corner margin. You could see where the, uh, the, the line of ink vertical there on the left, which is the edge. And you could see the bottom as well and a little bit of stray ink as this was pressed onto that paper. Uh, and it's a, a really just a, an extra fine copy. And you can see the watermark behind it on USIR, right? That's the United States uh, Internal Revenue special watermark paper that was used for revenues. These were used on that paper as well. So I hope I've given you an, oh, before I stop. I also like in case postage stamps. And of course, Ayers was more than happy to advertise. And he was more than happy to go that route when he could. Uh, the coin shortage, civil war, hoarding, silver, gold, copper, et cetera. And, you know, uh, we can spend a whole lot of time talking about the patent in 1862 by Galt. Uh, and this is also in your Scott catalog. If you go and look at the case postage stamps where postage stamps were used, legal tender, and they were encased. They have a mica on top of the National Bank Note Company, one cent, three cent. And on the back, Ayers, of course, did some advertising. Uh, he also used trade cards like others, and there's a nice little trade card at the top of his sugar-coated pills, the little favorites, and there's just an example of one of his bottles, a really nice aqua bottle that says Ayers Agu Cure, which those stamps were utilized on the top to seal them, uh, and I just didn't get a chance to recreate it, or you know I would have. And so I think I end there to give you a primer and an overview of medicine stamps private diet proprietaries. Here's some select references. You know, I'll put this on the website and I have more references I can share with you. Here's just a few, but these really are the ones that I go to. And there are some websites as well that are really good in summarize this, but you know, Holcomb 
really uh, published in 79, really is a great, if you're interested in the patent medicines, gives a phenomenal history of the firms and a lot of details that were uncovered from the archives. Uh, Christopher West, or as we better known him, Elliot Perry, he published under Christopher West, uh, published the U.S. Match of Medicine Stamps in 80. Uh, the census that I alluded to earlier by Aldrich was also published, the census of Match of Medicine. It's a really good book to have, and it's from 97. And I know that we continue to add to that census. Also, again, Christopher West, quote unquote, published 79, the Revenue Stamps in the United States. Another really good reference in general for U.S. stamps and included in that is the Match of Medicines. Um, uh, the uh, Topin, Dietz, and Holland, again, by Kasten Holtz is another good reference uh, for revenue stamps. And then finally, I just alluded to it. There are many other auction catalogs out there, and there's been other great collections that have been sold over the years. You can find even those online. But the, the, the Morton Jean Joyce uh, collection and that catalog, which is amazingly thick, uh, that was uh, from uh, Levitt in 91, is a phenomenal reference as well with great illustrations and descriptions. Uh, and descriptions. And so finally, I will end with that. I'll say thank you. I'll take questions. I'll stop sharing. And I will open it up to, uh, to, to the group. And I can always show uh, anything you would like. And again, thank you. Thank you for your attention, everybody. Thank you. I, I could hear work. that round of applause, by the way. I really appreciate you guys listening. Oh, yeah, silence yeah. here. I, I, I appreciate Thank you. So I hope I took you on an interesting journey. Uh, through a little of one of some of my favorite topics with some hopefully really nice examples. So questions, please, I'm open. Charlie, Dick Oberg. Um, I noticed that you have some, the, the printing quantities on a lot of the uh, the, the, the stamps. I'm, one, I'm surprised at the huge numbers up in the millions, but it seems to me that most of these things were printed in, in small sheets of some number. And so I'm surprised at the, at the numbers ending in, you know, twos and threes and ones. Um, how did how did they get those numbers when they were probably printed in multiples? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, a lot. Of, yeah. So so yeah, these are printed in. Some of them were printed in very odd sheets, right? Or odd sizes, depending on how they the format. They were not all printed in the traditional panes of a hundred that we know, yeah. you know, today. And so I think that lends itself to why you see some of those numbers ending in the numbers that you're ending in. And again, it's as best as the researchers can do and the references that I showed you when they look through the annals and the records of what was documented. And so I think it's a combination of those two things. Um, one, the way they were printed, the format that they were printed on, how the private doctor proprietors wanted them and then delivered. And so I think there was accommodations along the way by the various printers to meet the need uh, of the owner there uh, on the size and shape. You could, it's very broad, right? They are not printing traditional squares or rectangles that we're used to. Uh, in many cases. And so I think there was a lot of accommodation where I think you that, that accounts for the numbers being the way they are there. I hope that answered your question as best as I could answer it. Yeah, it's good. Thank upon, you. Yeah, based upon the research I've done. So yeah, you're welcome. Charlie, yeah. I have an interesting uh, sure. kind of a comment with the patent medicines when they're selling them back in the old days at circuses and carnivals and things, you know, you have the sideshow and they, they're uh, they had the medicines for sale and they'd give free samples and you do a before and after. If you could pick up this chest and what they were doing is the person couldn't pick it up and then he'd taste it and it'd feel stronger and he'd be able to pick up the chest. And what they're using was the early days of electromagnets and they would have the chest with a metal base and on the floor was a metal pad and uh, they couldn't pick it up when the, the magnet was on. It was just kind of a very interesting way of, of marketing those. There's always a shill in the audience, Paul. Yeah, and so, yeah. when, when I was a kid, my, my dad would get his whiskey bottle and it always came with the long pink ones and would always try to get it off and soak it. They must have used the glue like, I don't know, we never could get it off. It was thick. Well, so, yeah, so that's a really interesting point, too, because I got to tell you, the glue that was used back then, because I've seen a lot and I know others that collect these do as well. The, the adhesive that's on the back that still remains on some of these strips, for example, that thick. have been yeah. soaked off is amazingly thick, thick and crystalline and gooey. And it takes quite a bit if you're going to soak them for extended periods to kind of get it off. If you choose to go that route, some keep the adhesive on, uh, takes yeah. quite a bit of uh, a gentle manipulation with the soft brush to move it off. And then it is very thick. So they wanted these to adhere to the yeah. bottle. Yeah. That was the whole point. Uh, and so that it was permanently sealed until you snapped it off the top. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. 
any other questions or thoughts or comments or uh, really, I'm open. I'd like to thank you for an excellent uh, uh, show because the uh, eclect bottles got a lot of medicines stuff like that with labels and to tie it in with the stamps and everything else I mean stuff I do in fact I went into the kitchen and that's I don't know how to get it there but that's a ponds bottle we can't see it though move it over a little bit in front of the camera Jim I know oh, what you're okay. holding up yeah yeah okay there it is yep ponds mm -hmm. there's the ponds extract uh, right there where is it right there does it have the stamp on it still, the revenue stamp? And unfortunately, the top. Ah, the top is, yes, I see. Yeah, it's a saddle strap bottle. So it's, it's back in the uh, 1800s, but it, the stamp is missing on top. Mm -hmm. but yeah, and sometimes uh, for these bottles, so you know as well, and you'll see that with the perfumes, they did not put the stamp on the top. The stamp is on the foot of the bottle, usually on the perfume or the side. And you can still find many bottles. And a lot of the perfumes are in bottles that were shaped like boots or some floral pattern. And the stamp is still on, adhered on the bottom. And I can show those down the road when we do another session. I have a number of those as well. Um, really, uh, really pretty designs with those stamps on them. Many were die cut to fit. And they did use a very thick adhesive. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Jim. Any other no. questions or thoughts or comments? Well, Actually, I'll, I'll a question for Jim of Southwick, because yeah. the, the air company was in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is north of Boston. Well, right. I was stationed up there. I think there was an air in Massachusetts, isn't there? Yes, yeah. there is. You know, if air was named after that guy who brought money into the town, or is this a coincidence? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I have information on the air up in the attic with my... Uh, air bottles, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, haven't been up there for many a year. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jim. All right, Jim. We got to, we got to, uh, I'll be up there in about an hour and let's go start rummaging because you may have some uh, stamps on those boxes, Jim. Come on, let's go. Oh, no, I, I check for the stamps. <laughs> all right. I'm just checking. Unfortunately, those been all, all soaked and uh, yes, so, so I think I, their bottle yeah. shows. Yeah, what I want to just, I think for individuals that are thinking about collecting this, if you find revenues on documents, you know, or checks, I mean, I, I always like to keep them intact. I just think that's really important too. There's times when it's beyond repair or it's on a piece and soaking it off makes sense. But you can see with some of the boxes that I have and the wrappers and other things and bottles, I mean, keeping them intact and marrying them with the artifacts themselves, the stamps, if you can marry them, and an almanac and a trade card and a package and a bottle. I think it just makes for a nice, you tell a nice story that way. So, uh, yeah, again, you have to be careful when you preserve these. And that's I never the open them if it's got the yeah. stamp on Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not going to open the McLean's. That box is sealed since 1875, so I'm not going to open it. Any other questions? But let's go. I know we have David Hunt and we have other show and tells. I want to make sure we give everybody time. Just to want to thank you, Charlie. Oh, wait. Sure, please. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed that little trip through... Uh, through the the back of the book, if you will. Barb, did I see your hand? Uh, yeah, material. I had uh, just one thing I wanted to add. One thing he didn't mention, and I will do a quick share screen here. Is these? Which I assume you can see now. Can uh, Dr. Kilmer and Company Internal Revenue? These were provisionally used for the um, 1898 the Spanish American War. Mm. They are on uh, various, various uh, regular US stamp denominations. So if you see any of those, you wanna grab those. Yes, yeah, so those are outside, correct. And those are outside, those are provisionals, Dr. Kilmer, uh, 1895, they are listed as RS-307 to 315, I did not include those because quote unquote, they are provisional proprietaries that were used on US that were overprinted, but they're absolutely part of the medicine series. And following that, there are St. Louis proprietary stamps that are the labels that are internal revenue 
special notices, et cetera, et cetera. You find one of those and you should look in your Scott catalog. You, you know, you can put a kid through college if you find one of those. So uh, that's just kind of where they are in that, in that book uh, before you get to perfumes and playing cards. So there's that little provisional section, but you're right, Bob, I'm glad you shared that and showed that. Uh, right. And the Kilmers come in a few different types of styles of overprint on the U.S. small bank notes. So yeah, I, thanks, Bob. I think it's also interesting to, to note that during the period of time, I think you alluded to this, mm -hmm. the Civil War and the Spanish-American War, the companies actually paid for these stamps, even though there was no federal tax. That's correct. Absolutely. They wanted them for advertising. Yep. And, and I showed some of those pieces. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It was advertising for them. The people, during the tax period, folks got so used to seeing that stamp that they, there was a whole separate section of called facsimiles, and it is catalog. Springer Catalog does list them. Uh, for the stamps that were then converted to quote unquote facsimile uh, to look like the original tax stamps. They took the pro internal revenue off. I think I showed an example. Um, and uh, they then continued to use them because they branded their product and the public was used to seeing that particular image. So they absolutely kept going well into the 19 teens and 20s and beyond with that particular image. Herrick is a great example because he had his face in the middle of his stamp. And then it was on every box up until the 1920s, 30s. So, yeah, absolutely. They had, they had marketed, they branded, and they didn't want to pull back from that. Great point, Bob. Thank you. So it gave it legitimacy. Like you're still recognized by the United yes. States government, you know, yeah. pure food and all that. And I'm still not going to try one of those pills I showed you that's chocolate coated. It ain't going to happen, folks. <laughs> I know you'd like to see me try one, but 